Welcome back to Politics Nation. By the middle of the 18th century, one in five people in New York State was enslaved in some fashion. Slavery was eventually outlawed in the Empire State in 1827. But both before and after that, New York City was a major hub for the practice. As a lifelong New Yorker, I thought about all of this uh, this week when I, as head of National Action Network, joined New York Governor Kathy Hochul as the state formed its first exploratory commission for reparations for its black residents. Joining me now is New York Governor Kathy Hochul, a Democrat. Governor Hochul, uh, thank you for being with us. And, and let me say at the outset uh, that uh, as it was argued in the New York State Senate and, and, and the New York State Assembly, and we had uh, uh, people like State Senator uh, James Sanders in the Senate and Michelle Salongas in, in, in the Assembly fighting and pushing for this, and uh, led by, of course, the Speaker Carl Hasty and the Senate uh, leader Andrea Stewart Cousins uh, helping to advocate. You wrestled with this. And uh, you came to a decision that it was not a thing to deal with politically, but to do what is right to heal your state. And I remember uh, as we had the massacre of 10 blacks in Buffalo and you went to just about every funeral and stood with those families. You said to me at the last funeral, Whitfield funeral, we've got to heal these wounds, Reverend Al. And that was the same woman I saw tell me, I've decided to sign this. I want you to be there and speak. And uh, it's not about handing out money. Or, well, nobody's talking about the lotto here. We're talking about a real study to find out how we deal with the wounds of the past and to bring things together. Several cities and states of California and Illinois have explored, if not allocated, reparations to their black residents. You and I, as I said, have, have had deep talks about this and why you feel it's New York State's turn to take up this issue in an exploratory commission. Can you tell my audience what you've told me about why you felt this was the time to do it in a methodical, serious way? Well, Reverend Allen, again, thank you for being there to witness history in the state of New York. And there's so much division in our country today. Uh, religious division, racial division, ethnic division. And it's time for us as leaders to step up and say, let's heal. Now, healing is easy to say, but really hard to accomplish. And my thought was, is that, yes, this could be polarizing. This could be divisive itself. But I, as the head of New York State, if I step up and say what my journey was to come here as someone who grew up in a, a you know, blue collar, town and the shadow of the Bethlehem steel plant. My grandparents worked at the steel plant. My dad worked at the steel plant. I come from that world, which was very homogeneous, like many others. It's time for us to start understanding each other and having more empathy. And we cannot, as New Yorkers, ignore the, the disturbing history that there was a flourishing slave trade, not just in the South that everyone knew about, but right on Wall Street. And those slaves literally built the foundation of our economy in the state of New York. And generations later, their families are not benefiting in any sense compared to whites when it comes to home ownership, when it comes to health outcomes. I mean, my God, the rates of infant and child and maternal mortality among black women and black children, it's, it's as a mom, it's heartbreaking. So we have to step up and say we have to find ways for there to be more generational wealth, access to the best education, access to the best jobs. And this is the start of a conversation that is long overdue. It's a reckoning to let people know that racism is alive and well and even a place like New York, as you and I witness, when this white supremacist who was, had his mind so polluted by going on social media, a teenager drove three and a half hours to my hometown went to Buffalo, went to a Topps grocery store not far from where I live, and murdered people, not randomly at a mall, not randomly at a college campus, but targeted because of the color of their skin, and that was one year and a half ago. So the reality is, racism did not end with slavery. The vestiges are still here today, and I can't say I can bend the, uh, the arc of the moral universe with one hand, but teaming up with other New Yorkers, like-minded individuals who will have those hard conversations Maybe it's the start of some healing, not just in New York, but for the nation. 
I want to emphasize the, the, the core of what New York and other states and many cities either have done or will do when taking reparations, which is not just looking at slavery itself, but the subsequent impacts of slavery and Jim Crow on black residents, often over several generations, as you just mentioned. Can you tell us what those impacts look like in a highly diverse state like New York? You govern and have to deal with many communities, but in terms of just the descendants of slaves in New York, it is still a disproportionate impact that this commission has to look at as part of how we try to even that playing field. And the statistics are there, and they are shocking. When you think about the fact that immigrants, like my Irish immigrant grandparents, came over on the boat, they had an opportunity to say, I want to pursue a better life for my family. They willingly got on a ship, and they came here. And yes, they had discrimination at first, but two generations later, their daughter is the governor. That's what has happened for, throughout our history, except for those who didn't come by choice for a better life. They were dragged from their homes in chains and thrown not on the first deck, but in steerage, and had to suffer and endure, endure the indignities, not just as slaves, but those vestiges are real today. And we cannot turn a blind eye to those horrific statistics on why there's not wealth accumulated, why there is so little home ownership, policies like redlining and this home ownership discrimination that my parents fought against as 20-something young couple fighting for social justice and racial justice back in the 60s, they tried, and all these years later, the numbers are just as shocking. So it's home ownership, it's building wealth, it's access to the best jobs, and the health outcomes desperately need to improve. When you think about the number of people, people of color who died from COVID in disproportionate numbers to whites, you have to say, what is going on here? So we need to peel back and look at all those areas where there's incredible disparities and really work together because if one part of our community is still lagging behind, that affects everyone. And that's what we should have in this conversation mm. while everyone in New York should be interested in the outcome of lifting everyone up and allow, allowing them to have, uh, at least get on the next rung in the ladders of opportunity in the state of New York. Now, let me bring this to you. Yesterday, President Biden, Reverend, uh, President Biden pardoned Americans with certain marijuana offenses. He also pardoned 11 nonviolent offenders incarcerated for marijuana charges, some of them previously serving mandatory life sentences. Last month, you signed New York's Clean Slate Act into law, sealing the records over time of those convicted of certain nonviolent felonies and misdemeanors. Going back to timing, uh, why are criminal reform efforts so important, and why are they happening now? Well, first of all, better late than never, because they should have happened a long time ago. That being said, what is fascinating about the Clean Slate Bill in New York that I just signed is that this was driven by not just public defenders and, and families of people who had served time in jail, but also the business community. Because right now, there are so many opportunities for jobs in the state of New York. I have 460,000 open jobs. You want a job, you come to New York. So employers say, wait a minute, this is in, these are individuals, over 200,000 people, who paid their debt to society. These are not people who escaped. They're not people who never did their time. They paid their debt to society, and because of their record, they are still prohibited from being able to even get a job to take care of their families. So my view is the best crime-fighting tool I have is to give someone a job, and that's what this is about. Now, they're very serious offenses, murders and sex offenders. Their slate does not get wiped clean, but so many others who aren't able to have gainful employment because of that mark on their record, even from decades ago, mm. is a barrier to them to be able to take care of themselves and their families, because otherwise they have no alternative but to be a repeat offender, and that is not good for society. And the employers were so happy that they now have people that they can embrace as part of their family, give them a job, and let them take care of their family. That's the beauty of all this. Uh, I'm out of time, but I want to ask you about the issue of abortion. You recently criticized Texas abortion ban following the news that this month that a state resident would be forced to carry her unborn child to term, despite the child likely dying from a genetic defect. 
upon birth. She had to flee Texas in order to have the procedure performed. Then this week, we learned that a black woman in Ohio has been charged with a felony for felony abuse of a corpse after she miscarried into a toilet three months ago, after which she was later hospitalized for near fatal blood loss. Looking at stories like these, do you think abortion will be the national issue that drives turnout for Democrats with women specifically in 2024? It certainly will, because if anyone thought that the Supreme Court of the United States decision in Dobbs was just a one and done and it has no effect, look at what has happened in states like Texas and Florida and Ohio. These are real women who are being oppressed by predominantly men, mega Republicans, extremists, who, who want to dominate over women's bodies. That is the first woman governor of New York I find reprehensible. And it is shocking to me as a new grandmother of a one and a half year old little girl that she has less rights than I had growing up or my daughter have. So we have to take back our country and women will be leading the charge in the 2024 elections. And to ensure that we will have on the ballot in New York state a constitutional amendment that says that the right to an abortion is enshrined in our Constitution. And I encourage the women of this country to rise up if you are in a state that does not allow abortion to be legal and, and, and safe, then get it on the ballot. Petition to get it on the ballot. Get mm. it on the ballot and vote. And if you don't get the outcome you need, then vote with your feet and come to New York because we here and here in New York, we actually respect women's rights. All right. I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for being with us, New York Governor Kathy Hochul.